for joining us for our uh, public lecture. And uh, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Maxim Krikov. He's a research fellow at Malta Society's Research Institute, which is a part of the UCE's Graduate School of Development. And just a short info about Maxim. Uh, he holds a PhD in Natural Sciences from Hamburg University, Germany. Uh, his research examined the climate and human impact on natural resources in Kyrgyzstan with a special focus on uh, Ferdinand Ridge. Um, he has uh, published a number of articles on this uh, topic in international period <coughs> research journals and also presented his findings um, in a number of international conferences. And uh, also Maxim has a vast experience of practical working in nature uh, conservation organizations. This is the floor is yours. And I would like just to add that uh, the lecture will be in English. Is everyone okay with it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today on this open lecture. This is the part of my PhD thesis that I'm going to present today. So the topic is um, impact assessment of grazing and climate, climatic factors on soil and vegetation in Kyrgyzstan. It announcement we lost uh, the world soil, so it's not only vegetation but soil as well. Uh, with a focus on Fergana Range in southern Kyrgyzstan, but also with some implications wider for for the whole country. Um, so the content of the open lecture today, first I will start with the introduction, then I will go to problems and research questions. I will cover also human climate and soil interactions, which is based on second and third paper published by myself. So if you're interested, I can forward you the links to those papers. Uh, we'll discuss methods and results. Then I will move to climate and vegetation interactions, which, is co which are covered in the fourth paper of mine which can also forward you the links to and uh, we'll discuss methods, results and then we'll then switch to the conclusions uh, based on that. So first of all, a little bit of the place where we are, uh, some information about Kyrgyzstan. Well, um, as you know, Kyrgyzstan is a mountain country, so most of this area is covered with mountains. Uh, it's uh, situated in the center of the Central Asia. And because of the simple, of the complex orography and complex uh, geographic position, uh, it has different uh, ecosystems uh, uh, due to the vertical uh, zonation of the area and uh, graphical reflection of the area, as I said before. Um, so the study area on the slopes of Ragana range is here. This is the vicinity of Arslanbok area. So in uh, in the place of the walnut fruit forest in Kyrgyzstan, but my research area was not the walnut and fruit forest themselves, but the area above this uh, forest belt, the pasture area um, in this um, uh, study site. Now, a little bit about the Kyrgyz rural economy. As you probably know, um, more than half of Kyrgyzstan, the Kyrgyz population lives in rural areas. It's 64% of people who reside in rural areas. And urban, urban population is about 36% of the um, total population of Kyrgyzstan. And some information about, basic information about the natural resources. Uh, so most of the agricultural area covered uh, with the permanent meadows and pastures. And just a slightly big slide of this uh, blue belt over here, the arable land, the agricultural land in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, more than... Uh, Half of the population, about 64% of the uh, of Kyrgyz population, depends on pastures, uh, which are more than way more than half of the, all the agricultural areas in the country. And uh, some also also some background information about the livestock tendencies in Kyrgyzstan, about the livestock dynamics. As you see, yeah, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the number of livestock of different different livestock uh, started decreasing. And sometime after the year 1996-1997, it started increasing. And for some species, for some animals, it's now even more than during solid times. So the number of livestock is increasing in the basically rural area. Uh, a little bit about uh, 
problem. So before the Soviet Union started, uh, before the Soviet Union, when Kyrgyz people they were nomads, uh, they all depended very really much on natural resources. So they lived in yurts, uh, just, uh, the mobile houses, and they used to travel around different pastures, summer, winter pastures, um, throughout the year with their houses and their livestock. And as there were not so not so much livestock, not so many people, the natural resources, the grasses and mountains, they managed to recover between the, the movements of the uh, population. When the Soviet Union started, <coughs> the era of so-called so supported settled transhumans, <coughs> excuse me again, uh, so the past infrastructure was built, like the uh, high mountain corals and the bridges to reach those uh, high mountain pastures, they were built, constructed, and um, so in summer the livestock would go to summer pastures, in winter part of livestock would go to winter pastures, and they would uh, spend the coldest times overnight in corals, and some livestock would be kept in villages, and the van from somewhere outside of the country, from Kazakhstan or from Russia, will supply um, um, uh, hay or dry grass to, to the livestock to support it in winter. Um, so with, with that support and with this infrastructure build, the, um, uh, the, mount, the mountain grass ecosystem still managed to recover between the different visits of the, of the livestock. And after the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, the mountain infrastructure, pasture infrastructure, unfortunately became broken because there was no subsist, uh, subsidizers who were not supported anymore. But still the amount of livestock was the same and uh, there was no supply of the grass from the outside of the country. So the van, van would, would go here to the same area where the cows would go and collect hay from the same pastures and that would put a lot of pressure to summer pastures which are close to the villages. And over the year then the amount of livestock would increase and the amount of grass would decrease on summer close pastures and that's where uh, the problem comes from. Uh, the amount of livestock increases, the quality of livestock decreases because there's no breed, there's no centralized system that would follow the breed um, so and that will create a problem because there will be no more grass on uh, close pastures and a lot of grass here on the remote pastures. So that's basically the problem I was trying to address with the study. So this is how the pasture degradation looks like. Um, it is the uh, decrease of uh, vegetation cover. It is also the change of the species composition because the palatable species that uh, livestock eats, they um, they are more grazed, they are more consumed, they have less chances to reproduce themselves and the unpalatable species like Rangos um, and Rosa, uh, they, have, they are not eaten so they have more chances to um, propagate uh, so they uh, start expanding themselves in the pasture so it becomes more of unpalatable species than palatable species in the pasture. So here are my research questions. I was trying to understand what are the effects of the grazing impact on vegetation soil resources, what were the patterns of special distribution of soil cover factors and soil readability, the C factor and K factor, so called universal soil vegetation that I'm going to talk about later, and how vegetation climate interact in temporal spatial domains on the country scale, and to what extent vegetation growth determined by the climate. So for the assessment of soil loss, I was using the revised universal soil loss equation. This is a, as, it's, uh, as, it is, as it comes from its name, a revised version of the universal soil loss equation, which was developed by Wishman and Sweet. Those are American soil scientists that um, developed this model to, uh, to help to understand or to model the soil loss on different terrains. It's based basically on the rainfall erosivity index on precipitation, on soil uh, properties itself, on topographic properties of the area, on the cover management factor, how vegetation is being managed, how much vegetation is there, and on conservation, uh, soil conservation practice factors. So all these factors, they've been calculated according to different equations, they, they just multiply with each other, and as a result you get how much tons per acre 
per acre or per hectare you lose uh, of soil you lose annually. Um, to try to understand that, I did some data collection. So I was doing digital field work. During the field work, I was doing vegetation description. I was taking some soil samples. Uh, the top soil samples, uh, I was doing interviews with local people to try to understand how much livestock they have there, where they are, how they manage the livestock when they come to the pastures when they leave. So what are the patterns, what is the system of the grazing they use. Um, I was also collecting climate data from the local weather station and from open sources as well. And I was also using the multi-sense data that are available from the open sources. Um, well, the sampling design. So these are the two study sites. This is a Kazumkur village and this is Arslanbok village in the south of Kyrgyzstan. I had two study sites. One is Uchoku, which is actually a big study site consisting of three uh, um, Uchoku, uh, Karabulak, and Jajerim. I call them all three Uchoku, and one remote, which is called Otuzar. So I was trying to compare these two sites with each other. Uh, the Uchoku study site is close to the villages, as you can see, and Otuzar is a uh, remote study area far away from there. So to address these issues, I used the um, Latin hypercube sampling approach where I tried to cover the different elevation bells from uh, uh, 2000 to 2008 meters above the sea level with a 100 meter step. And I was trying to cover all the different aspects, the eight different aspects like north, north, east, east, and so on. Uh, different slopes, shallow slopes, the middle slopes, and steep slopes, and in total I collected 230 uh, two vegetation descriptions and soil samples. Uh, so, a little bit of equation, so you don't have to concentrate too much on this. So, I was basically <coughs> trying to assess the C factor, the, the color management, the vegetation factor in the area, and the soil erodibility factor. So, these are the equations. How I calculated all the different factors from the data that I have collected in the field. Um, and this is how I was doing the C-factor modeling. So I took the C-factor data collected in the field and was um, trying to understand its relation with the NDVI, which is normalized different vegetation index, which is a remotely sensed vegetation index that um, you basically calculate from the satellite images. Uh, the, um, this index um, depicts the the amount or the density of uh, photosynthetic active vegetation in the area. So I did a linear, non-linear regression analysis trying to predict C factor with NDVI. I run it, so I've got the regression equation, then I applied it to the NDVI images of the uh, vegetation season from uh, the April to <coughs> November. And I did some temporal correlation analysis trying to predict NDVI and C factor with climatic factors. <coughs> and uh, calculate 13 year male annual C factor for the area and I came up with a correlation chart. So these are the methods basically. Now let's go through the <coughs> results. So this is the main result, the regression equation of C factor, trying to predict C factor with NDVI. So this is the curve. Uh, my result and result of different researchers, not, not necessarily in Kyrgyzstan, uh, from different researchers somewhere else. And you can see that the um, the curve for Kyrgyzstan uh, coincides uh, very much with the curve for uh, Central Europe. So, so actually this equation can also be used to predict the uh, C factor for various conditions. And this is the regression equation that can be used to calculate C factor, at least for the south of Kyrgyzstan, using um, NDVI. Mm. Um, so based on that, I generated this map, so C factor. Uh, spatial distribution here, you can see those two different study sites and where uh, the areas are red, the C factor is higher so you can expect more soil loss in these areas and uh, the green in green areas you can expect less soil loss so these purple triangles are the tens of uh, herders in the areas so the bigger the triangle is, the more livestock they have there um, and this is, these are the average, the mean Values so you can see that for Uchoku, the, the area which is closer to the villages, the C factor is uh, 0.27, whereas for Otozar, the remote pasture, uh, the C factor is 0.2. 
So uh, on remote on remote pastures, you can expect less soil loss than on the closed pastures. And these images, these uh, maps, can actually be used for the soil loss modeling in the area and in the vicinity. Um, here is some information about the interaction of sea factor with temperature and precipitation in the area on the interannual and the seasonal scale. So I did a trend decomposition analysis, and here you can see the green line is vegetation, uh, I mean sea factor, uh, red line is temperature, and uh, blue line is precipitation in two different, in these two sides. And you can see that the um, green line is very, uh, green line is, is very much in agreement with the red line with temperature. So based on this information, we can say that on years, on hot years, you can expect more soil loss than on um, um, cold years because of less vegetation, because high temperature depresses vegetation a lot, and that, that's why vegetation can erode uh, the soil in the area easily. Um, same picture on the seasonal level. So this is the key factor modeling. I was trying to predict the key factor. The key factor is uh, the factor that shows how much soil is prone to er er erosion. So the soil erosivity factor. So the greatest key, key factor is um, the easier the soil can be eroded. And this is the soil property. I was trying to predict that with uh, soil enhancement, ratio, which is a remotely sensed uh, ratio that you basically calculate from uh, satellite images uh, from channel network base level, which is a topographical index from sign of, uh, of the bearing of the slope and from the slope itself and the curvature. So I ran all this stuff through the multiple regression analysis, I got the regression equation and then I applied the regression uh, um, universal creating approach, but I did everything separately because I wanted to control. So I didn't run it through uh, the universal creating uh, tool, but I did everything manually, so to say. So I did uh, linear uh, regression for the K factor rest and the uh, I did a regression, uh, I applied a regression equation to predictors to come up with the K factor raster and I did the ordinary creating over residuals and I summed it up and came up with the K factor map. So this is some correlation information for all the predictors that I've used, and this is the, um, the regression equation. And here are the maps. Here you can see as well, the, uh, the red areas are those areas which are more prone to soil erosion. The blue areas are the areas where the soil is less prone to soil erosion. And here as well you can see from this uh, box charts that the uh, closed areas, the Uchoku, the Uchoku pastures, which are close to the villages, they are more red, so they are more prone to soil erosion than the remote pastures. And what those are the faraway pastures. So, uh, the results, the summary from, from these results, the overgrazing causes more damage on steeper slopes than on flat terrains. There are some results which uh, we can see from this map, and steep slopes are more red than the flat areas because it's easier to damage the soil uh, by, um, by cattle trampling on the steep slopes. The close pastures, pastures expected to have higher soil erosion due to overgrazing or remote pastures. This is sort of common sense. You could have expected that. And soil um, vegetation features can be predicted with terrain and remotely sensed indices. Yeah, this is quite trustworthy. And C factor is negatively inf influenced by precipitation and positively by temperature in the long term, which we saw on those. Um, time series correlation charts. And the derived regression can be used for soil loss prediction, however it needs long-term observation for corrections, because based on the universal soil loss <coughs> equation, on this equation, I could have, this one, I could have calculated the total soil loss in the area, but I didn't do that because it wouldn't have the scientific validity, because you need a long-term soil runoff uh, experiments to validate this. Uh, because these are the absolute values that you get here. And for the just C factor and K factor, these are the relative factors, so you can compare different areas between each other, which one, uh, which areas are more prone to soil erosion. So this would have some scientific value. Well, now let's switch to the vegetation and climate interaction, which is actually more interesting. But <laughs> 
what you've been hearing so far. <laughs> Um, uh, for this study, I used the, uh, uh, the whole area of Kyrgyzstan plus some areas right outside of the borders of Kyrgyzstan for the modeling. What I was trying to do, I was trying to predict the uh, um, vegetation with climatic factors like temperature and precipitation, considering different spatial characteristics. So I was considering that in different areas, these interactions can be different. Plus, I was considering that the reaction of vegetation and change in temperature and precipitation can be slightly delayed in time. So I was also considering the temporal lags when I was doing this modeling. So again, for the vegetation proxy, I was using the NDVI, normalized different vegetation index, which you calculate from satellite images. Um, the land surface temperature, which is also the raster image, uh, so to say, from which is also calculated from uh, satellite images and precipitation image. So I did uh, seasonal and trend decomposition analysis and the cross correlation of seasonal and trend factors that I plugged everything uh, that I um, then I built the rasters with the lags of maximum, minimum, absolute maximum, absolute minimum correlations of temperature uh, with vegetation and uh, precipitation with vegetation. And this was fed into the cluster analysis and we came up with five different vegetation and climate interaction clusters. And I also did the trend and season R squared. I calculated the trend and season R squared to see how much uh, vegetation is actually being controlled by temperature and, precipi and precipitation and where. So uh, that was short and now I'm going to explain in more details what I was doing. So to all these rasters of uh, NDVI temperature and precipitation from the year 2000 to the year 2014, I did a um, signal trend decomposition using the STL approach. So for each each pixel time series, each pixel row, um, I decomposed the seasonal component. Uh, so that the seasonal component indicates uh, the change of uh, this value um, among, among the year because uh, the this, this season here will be a year because the pattern will, will repeat itself annually. I also decomposed the trend decomposition and to remind you, if you um, the, um, the method works that way that if you sum up the three components at the end, you will come up with the initial data. <coughs> so from uh, the seasonal and trend components, um, uh, to the seasonal and trend components, I applied the trend correlation analysis. I was uh, doing correlation between precipitation and DVI, precipitation and temperature on seasonal scale, and between precipitation and DVI, precipitation, um, uh, um, precipitation and DVI, and DVI and temperature on the trend, the trend components and seasonal components. So I came up with a, um, uh, this correlation charts to actually indicate how much uh, these components are, are correlate over time. That means how much um, precipitation today uh, I mean, vegetation today correlates with precipitation today, how much vegetation today correlates with precipitation yesterday, and so on. So with different timelines. Um, uh, this correlation lags were then put back together into the raster images of lags of maximum, minimum, absolute maximum, and absolute minimum correlations which were fed into the cluster analysis and they kind of came up with the different clusters. So here are the clusters. In, on this map, I came up with five clusters. Uh, in each of the cluster, you can expect a different pattern of vegetation and climate factors interactions. So this area would be different from this area, from this area, and from this area in terms of vegetation and how vegetation reacts to temperature and precipitation. So let's talk about the first cluster. The first cluster, these blue areas here, are basically steps, lowland plants, grasslands, and semi-deserts. And here is the, the seasonal part of it. So the green line is vegetation, red line is temperature, and blue line <coughs> is precipitation. So you can see that the green line follows really closely to precip with precipitation, and it's slightly shifted to the right with the temperature curve. So, uh, in these areas, you can say that vegetation is very much controlled by uh, precipitation and just slightly controlled by the temperature. On the seasonal scale, but on the temporal scale, you can see that the green line follows really closely the precipitation uh, line and is opposed by the temperature line. 
So in these areas, on the years with high precipitation, you can expect more vegetation, and on, on hot years, you can expect less precipitation. But actually, there's a strong, <coughs> strong negative correlation between uh, precipitation and temperature, so that's why you can say that the year with a lot of precipitation is a year with uh, not, not much temperature, it's a cold year, and with a lot of uh, vegetation. The second cluster, this area, is a field mode agricultural landscape, basically, with some artificial irrigation. Here the picture is very similar, but slightly different, just in, as in the cluster before. Uh, the vegetation is very, uh, follows really closely um, uh, the precipitation curve, but it is influenced by the temperature more than the cluster before. But on the seasonal scale, on the interannual scale, uh, the picture is, is really the same. So on rainy years, there's more vegetation on these areas. <coughs> on hot years, there's not much vegetation in these areas. And here we come to the cluster number three. It's a high mountain plains, high altitude tundras. Uh, the picture is totally different. Here you can see that the precipitation on, seasonals, on seasonal level, uh, precipitation and temperature, they come very closely, and vegetation as well. So in these areas, actually, Presentation is not that scarce of a resource, but rather temperature is. So um, in these areas, um, high temperature is favorable for, for vegetation and a lot of uh, precipitation as well. Because uh, there's a lot of moisture here, there's so basically high altitude swamps, uh, there's, there are glaciers, streams and everything. Uh, so vegetation on these areas is not that much dependent on precipitation because there is moisture. Uh, but uh, temperature is more uh, uh, is a better resource than in, in previous clusters. And on interannual scale you can see the totally positive picture. Uh, you can see you can expect more vegetation on warm years than in, in rainy and cold years. So uh, this shows that on such a small area is Kyrgyzstan because of the um, high altitude belts you can expect different patterns of vegetation reaction to temperature and to precipitation so it's not like a fixed rule that the more the more precipitation the better the, the less temperature the better it's all different depending on where you are class number four is a really complex complicated cluster here the um, the seasonal distribution of temperature and precipitation is like in cluster 3, so they all seasonally co coincide and the same for vegetation. So in the middle of the season, in summer, you can expect more temperature on average, more precipitation and more vegetation. But on the interannual scale, the picture is very different. You can see that there's a, this is a, here, you can see a complex interplay between temperature, precipitation and vegetation. So this shows that it is a proper combination of temperature and precipitation, actually, that will boost the vegetation development in, on this area. So if, if it's too hot or too cold, it's bad, so you can't say for sure that the more the, the hotter, the better. It should be a proper combination of the two factors that uh, will help uh, vegetation to develop. Cluster number five is another interesting cluster. So these are the areas where the artificial irrigation is very well developed. So Precipitation does not play that much of a role in vegetation control in these areas. Uh, you see, vegetation follows uh, uh, temperature really closely. Those these areas are really hot, but it's because of the artificial irrigation. They don't uh, um, feel that much of uh, um, a moisture um, deficit. So um, as soon as uh, temperature as sun comes, there is enough water. So there is temperature and sunlight that will boost the agriculture in these areas and, and the water is always provided by the artificial irrigation system. And on the intra-annual level still you can see that the green, green line, the vegetation line follows the precipitation line. Why that? It's because the, the water for the system of artificial irrigation is still provided by precipitation, it doesn't come from space. So on, in the year when there's no precipitation, um, there is no water in the artificial irrigation system. So if there is water, there is water in the artificial irrigation system. It just helps to take the precipitation from this part, from this, from this season, from spring to, to here, to the summer. That's what it does. 
but it can it cannot hold uh, precipitation or moisture to the next year. It's not that efficient. So the summary. I think we're approaching the end already. <laughs> Temperature precipitation can be as promoting, so limiting factors for vegetation. So it's not a 100% rule that uh, temperature is bad. It is good in spring where the vegetation starts, but then it burns everything in summer. And depending on different on different ecosystems, on different parts of Kyrgyzstan, different elevations, and all those belts, it can play different roles as temperature, so precipitation. Uh, and here's the adjusted R square for the seasonal component. So uh, the red areas are those areas uh, where vegetation is very much controlled by climatic factors. So uh, red areas are the areas where vegetation is controlled by climatic factors. The blue areas and blue areas, vegetation does not depend on any climate at all. So it, it, it ha there is no reaction of vegetation or NDVI whatsoever representing vegetation in the blue areas independent of climatic factors. Why? So here there's not much vegetation, these are glaciers, so there's no reaction depending on, um, on climatic factors. These areas are actually deserts. So the Kalmakan Desert, Mimkum Desert in Kazakhstan, and here it's not that red because of the system of artificial irrigation that I said before that helps to, um, to elaborate, to sort of uh, to make the impact of climatic factors less, it helps to soften the impact of climatic factors in these areas. Whereas for the rest of Kyrgyzstan, basically, vegetation is strongly dependent on temperature and precipitation as seasonally so interannually. So in case of climate change, if every, anything shifts, if the peak of precipitation shifts in some of these areas, if peak of temperature shifts seasonally, if the total, uh, the, uh, the mean precipitation temperature interannually increases or decreases, the whole of Kyrgyzstan will be badly impacted. On the seasonal scale, but on the trend scale, it's not that much, the interannual scale. Uh, these areas are very much dependent on climatic factors, but the rest are not that much dependent on climatic factors. Basically because, um, well, the plain areas they have more vegetation, but not these areas. So, in case of interannual, so I, I I was wrong before. Because in case of interannual change, if the trend of temperature and precipitation increases or decreases, these areas will not be impacted by that. So, if there is global warming or something, these areas will not suffer at all. But rather, these areas will suffer. And these are agricultural, not these 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 are pastures, and these are agricultural areas. So they will be strongly influenced by the climate change. Summaries again. So changing temperature and precipitation have different impact, impact strengths in vegetation in different ecosystems and in different geographic conditions. As I said before, and seasonal redistribution of climatic parameters is more severe for plant communities on future annual change. As you can see in this picture, the seasonal picture is more red than the uh, trend picture. So we have to be afraid that the rain season will not be in spring, um, but, but in some more than there will be more or less uh, um, uh, precipitation or temperature. Uh, and some final conclusions. So grazing has apparent uh, contribution to vegetation degradation, as I've shown before. And heavy rains and springs and hot summers can aggravate soil erosion in southern Kyrgyzstan. Climatic parameters have different impact on vegetation resources in temporal and spatial domains. So depending on where you are, uh, and um, annually, is it annually or seasonally, uh, the climatic factors can have different impact on vegetation resources. Seasonal distribution of temperature and precipitation can have severe effect on planning communities. And areas with artificial irrigation are less affected by climate change. So this is kind of uh, again in high altitude. Pastures are highly affected by climate change, and you can see this um, very bad. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to all these organizations for providing the data and instruments for the analysis of, thank of you this work. Thank you very much.